Thank you for joining us today at the AI Explained. Uh, the topic today is graph neural networks and generative AI. Um, I'm Krishna Gade. I'm the CEO of Fiddler AI. Um, we have been hosting this show for the past year or so now, and uh, I'm very excited to welcome our special guest, uh, Yurei Leskovich. He's a professor at Stanford uh, School of Computer Science and uh, co-founder at Kumo. Yure, I had the good fortune to work with Yure uh, briefly at Pinterest when he was a chief scientist. And also congratulations, Yure, uh, on the you know significant accomplishment on the SIG KDD 2023 Innovation Award. Yeah, thank uh, you. For your contributions to graph mining, in network science, and applied ML. Great. So welcome, Yure. Uh, uh, great, great to have you. Uh, so I guess uh, you know, let's start with. Uh, you know, you started, you've been working on this graph neural networks. Uh, I think this is the topic of the show. Uh, maybe you could give us an overview of graph neural networks and how do they differ from other neural networks? Uh, sure. So yeah, uh, no, uh, hi everyone. Excited to be here. Um, what to say? So I've been working on graphs for a very long time um, and actually started working on this when social networks emerged. Um, and at that point in time, you know, we were very, it was fascinating to say, hey, these natural graphs are emerging. Uh, can we quantify them? Can we understand them? Can we measure them? And uh, actually just uh, 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 yesterday I realized, you know, like the, the um, 15 years ago is when this was happening. And, uh, you know, I was an intern as a PhD student at Microsoft at that time. And we took the Microsoft Instant Messenger. It was the first kind of planetary scale of how people talk to each other and and what is kind of the social network of the of the entire world and and we uh, we kind of verified the six degrees of separation hypothesis uh, that you know goes back in social sciences to 1960s so that's kind of where we started but really um in in networks it was always around how do we model how do we how do we how do we predict and it was extremely extremely hard right if you think about if you have a graph and you want to build a machine learning model on top of it, you know, nodes have attributes, features, um, edges have properties. Usually everything is time stamped. You have different types of entities. And the question is, how would you take that data and make it ready for machine learning model to consume? Mm -hmm. And in the, in the old days, it meant you had to do feature engineering. And then the problem with feature engineering is, how do you capture the network structure around you, right? So if you just think, right. let's say from the social network point of view, it's like yourself. So maybe what's your degree? How many connections you have? Then yeah. how many connections do your neighbors have? Uh, are your neighbors connected with each other? What types of neighbors do, do, do you have? What are their features, properties, genders, ages, locations, and things like that? And you can see how this is, you know, exponentially harder to do manually than the traditional um, feature engineering. Um, yeah. that people have been doing, let's say, on uh, on traditional ML. So it was right. very, very hard. Um, then the first kind of set of methods uh, we invented was around um, embeddings. So basically saying, yeah. can we build task agnostic node embeddings? Um, mm. And this was, you know, back in 2015 or so, uh, when uh, methods like word to vec yeah. Uh, were invented and we generalized those uh, to graphs uh, and the methods uh, on the graph side are called deep walk or node to vec mm -hmm. um, and those were uh, basically kind of uh, task agnostic shallow embeddings so the assumption was you are given a graph no node types no edge types just a wire structure and you want to learn or uh, the embedding of every node so we want to no estimate coordinates for every node the node to vec is basically built out of the adjacency matrix of the graph. Essentially, the input is the adjacency matrix. And mm -hmm. then what you really do is you do random walks on that adjacency matrix. Uh -huh. And then you are basically trying to pre predict what nodes, if you start from a node, what other nodes get visited. And that right. prediction is based on a kind of a, a softmax logistic model of the embeddings. And you are right. estimating the coordinates of every node. Right. Um, so it means the number of parameters in this model is right. is linear in the size of the graph because right. every node you have to estimate its coordinates. Exactly. The, so you're basically looking at the n-dimensional vector where n is the number of vertices and you're basically trying to create an n times d. Each n times d. Exactly. Exactly. 
Eight. Exactly. Number of nodes times the dimension. Um, and that has been a huge revolution and, and mm -hmm. it really improved performance on link prediction and, and node classification and things like that. And uh, mm -hmm. the more, for example, this was heavily used by Facebook uh, and mm -hmm. it's implemented in PyTorch Big Graph. Mm. Right, they built a industrial scale distributed system to kind of learn the embeddings of all these things. But it's yeah. very finicky because first you are learning this in a task agnostic way, mm. um, so it's not specific to the entity you want to uh, to task you want to predict. Uh, and uh, whenever the graph changes, whenever new nodes get added, you have to recompute all the embeddings. You have to right. re-estimate positions of all the nodes. Right. So, right. so it's kind of not pretty expensive. Not yeah, very expensive, right? So yeah. then this brings us to the notion of graph neural networks, right? Mm -hmm. If the, these embeddings, we call them shallow embeddings, task, task agnostic embeddings, shallow in a sense that you have the, you, as a part of your learning process, you estimate these coordinates in a, mm -hmm. and that's it. There's no neural network. Mm -hmm. So then this brings us to graph neural networks. Um, and graph neural networks are an extremely general way to look at neural networks. Mm -hmm. And in, in, if you look at it mathematically, graph neural, like for example, a convolutional neural network or even yeah. a transformer is a is a subclass of a graph neural network. So mm. I can write a CNN in the kind of graph neural network formalism. So it's extremely general. And mm. it's general, I, I can say more, but it's general in a sense that it allows us now to apply deep learning, to uh, allow us to apply representation learning to complex data. Right. And I say complex data, you know, image is a fixed size matrix and I have my convolutional operator that kind of, I think I can, you know, I'm sliding. Text yeah. is a linear sequence and I'm right. learning these self attentions. But graph is neither. Graph is much more, more complex in a sense that I can take text and represent it as a line graph. I can take a matrix and I can represent it kind of as a grid graph. Right. Uh, but if I have a general graph, um, then it's unclear how those models would generalize. Right. Um, it captures the relationships. If you have, if you can model a sentence into a graph, it's not only looking at adjacent words, but it's also able to like look at uh, relationships of words across, you know, wherever they are in that sentence. Right. So exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And um, um, here, I think the the way to maybe think of uh, um, uh, uh, these uh, these types of uh, um, uh, these types of models, these types of graph neural networks, is that this is a very flexible modeling architecture. And it's a modeling architecture that kind of um, adapts to the shape of the data. It adapts to the local shape of the data. Mm -hmm. So the way, so that's kind of the key here. And another way to think of graph neural networks is that they are a message passing architecture on top of the graph. Mm -hmm. And another way to say it, and I'll, I'm using a lot of my hands, is the following, is to think that you have a node and you'd like to predict something about that node. Yeah. Of course, that node has a set of features. So the easiest way to predict about a node is to use the node features to predict something, maybe whether the customer is going to churn or something. Let's maybe concretize yeah. it in the, in the case of a use case, Yuri. So what, okay. what, what have you found a very compelling use space for GNN you know, in practice and oh, how yeah. does it work? I, yeah. I, let, I mean, I can say a few things so we we pioneered this technology and really scaled it up like thousand mm. times bigger than what was done before uh, at pinterest mm. um, and we built um, we basically built a gnn learning platform for mm. recommendations mm. Um, and it had huge impact uh, on the bottom line of uh, of mm. pinterest across mm. a number uh, of different use cases from recommendations, shopping, advertising, uh, mm -hmm. fraud, uh, uh, this kind of uh, trust mm -hmm. and safety as or uh, however you integrity, however you want to call it, mm -hmm. um, things like that. Um, mm -hmm. And let me explain you now how how why GNNs uh, work so well. The reason GNNs work so well is let's say in this let's take uh, social media as example. Yeah. Um, and then we can talk where, where other domains where this can be applied, right? But let's say you are, let's say, social media company, right? You have users, you have, I don't know, posts, right. you have interactions, you have follows and so on, right? So in the traditional way, you can take the user and predict something about the user. Let's say we are predicting churn in a sense. Will the user log in in the next two weeks or not or something? Yeah. So another way to think of this is when I want to make a predict prediction about you, I can take information from your neighbors, whatever posts you have written, whatever other posts you have liked, whatever, whatever other users you are connected to. Yeah. 
So this means that for you, I take these neighbors of yourself. And then mm -hmm. these neighbors can take also the neighbors of neighbors. So I can mm -hmm. do almost like a BFS tree around you. And that BFS tree, I can now I'll arrange in a tree. And that's a neural network architecture now, mm -hmm. right? Where you basically take information, let's say two, three, four hops away from you, take the features of those nodes and learn operators that take those features, transform them. And then mm -hmm. every node on the top kind of aggregates from the, from the children. Mm -hmm. and sends it to the parent. So it means now that if, if I'm predicting about you, I'm using information about all your interactions and all mm -hmm. the interactions of those interactions mm -hmm. in, in an optimal end-to-end -end way for your predictive task. Mm -hmm. And what this means when I say the model adapts is that if you have a lot of friendships and a few posts, yeah. the, the, the BFS tree around you will look very different then for, I don't know, some different user who has different posts and things like that, right? So basically yeah. every node in a graph defines it, in some sense, defines it its own neural network structure, right? It defines its own computation, uh, you know, forward pass graph. Yeah. And usually we, we do this, you know, a number of steps deep, as many as you like. In yeah. social networks, it is less. If you have molecules or proteins or these spatial graphs that, that are very big, we can do hundreds uh, of, of uh, um, uh, levels uh, deep to basically yeah. then learn how do you optimally propagate information from faraway points to the, of the network to the center yeah. so that uh, you make accurate prediction. Right, right. And what is good about this, it, this is able to learn... Uh, we basically have math and theorems to prove that it's able to learn both the structure of the network around you as well as mm -hmm. the properties of the nodes that mm -hmm. are around you. So it's mm -hmm. naturally able, for example, to learn collaborative filtering. Right. Uh, to say, oh, you are connected to these products that other users are connected to. What are those users connected to yeah. on the other end? Right. So let's yeah. recommend that. Yeah. That's one way. So, so like in recommender systems, right, like you mentioned collaborative filtering, there at one point in the last few years, the two tower networks became very popular and lots of companies, you know, mm -hmm. implemented them for recommendations models. Is, is a GNN a generalization of a two tower model or how does it differ from that? I mean, um, a, a two tower model at the end, you are basically scoring something and something. Correct. But what's, what, you know, yes, you are on top of the tower, but what's below the tower? Mm -hmm. uh, and you can think of like usually you would have a GNN to be below the tower, mm -hmm. right? The reason for that is that in this in these uh, use cases, really what defines an entity is its it, it, its its interactions, right. right? You know, I'm user one two three four. This is my age. I I you know I live in Silicon Valley. I mean, that's all you know about me. It's like you are very data poor about me. And but what you really know about me is. What do I click? What do I buy? What do I interact with? Right. So what's your knowledge about me comes right. from these interactions. Right. So you have to account for these interactions right. in right. the model naturally to kind of enrich because otherwise you just have my static profile or whatever. Even right. for example, at Pinterest, right? At Pinterest, yes, we have images, text, every pin, right? It's an image and text and so on. You'd say, wow, so much information, right? right. But then when you build computer vision models on top of these images, it's like, the, the 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 vision model gets confused you know is this uh, is this uh, a soil or is it mm. ground meat is this a rug to put on the floor or is it a tapestry to hang on the wall it looks mm. about the same you mm. know is this a garden fence or is it a bed railing they both look kind of the same right mm. but mm. if you look at user interactions yeah then this get totally separated out in the graph. So what people tagged each one will give you a lot more information. For example, so when I'm creating an embedding of the image, I build a neural network that takes other images that also these users interact with. So yeah. you can be like, okay, I don't know whether I'm a rug or a tapestry, but yeah. people who also clicked on other images, they clicked on rugs, yeah. on something that's obviously a rug. So maybe, you know, I am a rug as well. Yeah, yeah, makes so sense. that's kind of where this uh, becomes uh, very, very powerful. Yeah, I mean, social networks obviously uh, are amenable to be modeled as graphs and makes a ton of sense to, you know, use this type of technology for recommendations. You In one of your talks, you mentioned that the tabular data, you know, the kind of the bread and butter models most people build, your customer acquisition models, churn prediction models, fraud detection models. You mentioned that machine learning on that tabular data is brittle. 
you know, yes. could you elaborate right. more there? Yeah, exactly. So this is something I'm I'm really really excited about because it always has kind of bothered me that you know uh, you needed to have a graph. And then if if you were a social network company, you said, okay, I admit I have a graph. Yeah. But but everyone else says, no, I don't have a graph. Go away, kind of right. And and then really creating a graph was left to the kind of human imagination. Mm -hmm. So. What we are pioneering at, uh, at, uh, at my current uh, startup called uh, Kuma, Kuma.ai, is basically a way to automatically generate graphs and apply deep learning to your data. Mm -hmm. so, so now, basically, the claim I'd like to make is that everyone has a graph. And yeah. why does everyone have a graph? Because your most valuable data is stored in a relational database. You have multiple tables that are connected with primary foreign key relations. And for you to do machine learning over a database today, over your relational tables, is to join these tables and aggregate them. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, that's kind of a terrible way to do it because you have this rich data, richly connected, and now you are manually joining these tables, right? You say, I join the user table with the purchases table, yeah. And now I'll compute the average purchase price. Yeah. And then, you know, two weeks later, another data scientist will come and say, oh, I don't, I won't compute the average. I'll compute the average on a Sunday. Look, my dear manager, I provided lift to our model. Where is my promotion? Yeah. You know what I mean, right? So you build lots of feature engineering and try to come up with clever features that will improve the model. Exactly. Yeah. Like, and I'll, I'll tell you, like at, at one of the um, uh, 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 leading uh, companies who does uh, this kind of uh, um, uh, uh, rentals of rooms, a price of the room is encoded as 120 different features. Okay. <laughs> so it means that there is 120 spark jobs or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Uh, data breach jobs, whatever you want to call them, that compute, th that take that single price input and compute 120 different values. So it's 120 different jobs that have to run every day, every night, every hour, that then some data scientists can now take this 120 and build a model, right? And this yeah. means that years of time went into thinking, how do you encode a yeah. price of a room? Right. So you're so, explicitly modeling the interactions in these features, basically. Exactly. Yeah. So what we can do at, at Kuma um, is that you basically come in and say, here's my set of tables. Here is primary foreign key relations between them. You kind of register your schema. And now you can start building machine learning models on top of this without any feature engineering. So no feature engineering, no feature experimentation, because the insight here is that you can take your database, your tables, you represent this as a heterogeneous hypergraph. And now you can apply graph neural networks to, the, to learn how to propagate information across the graph, which is how to propagate information across the tables mm -hmm. to give you accurate prediction. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing here is that you never do a join. Mm -hmm. It's the neurons who are kind of joining and aggregating data yeah. on yeah. the fly, right? So the neuron learns how to take your age and your location and how to combine this with cross that with some other locations to give you yeah. the optimal feature for whatever you are predicting. Lots of people still claim today that, uh, you know, they've not been able to successfully apply neural networks on tabular data and, you know, XGBoost is still the kind of king yeah. of models for tabular data, right? How That's have a huge, the yeah. th there is a huge uh, sloppiness in your statement. <laughs> Sorry. So what's sloppy? Because it, it's terrible, right? When people say tabular data, you think, oh, yeah, probably they mean multiple tables. No, mm -hmm. they don't. They mean one table. Right. right now, show me a real use case where you have one table. You don't have one table. You have multiple tables. Yep. So how do you go from multiple tables to one table is you go through feature engineering. Mm -hmm. Right. Correct. And after you've done your feature engineering, yeah, now you apply XGBoost. Uh, you can you know, apply a, a kind of tabular transformers and things like that. But it, it's to me, this is kind of it's a problem that 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 doesn't you know what I mean? It's like it's a you already done so much work to join these tables and come up with the features. Yeah. But that's not the big problem. The big problem is how to go from multiple tables engineer. to one table. So, so in this case, GNNs are not replacing XGBoost. They're making your feature engineering 
better or faster? Is that what the G the GNNs just make predictions of the stuff you want? Okay, so you, they can actually also make the and not only the feature. It's an end to end. Predictions. It's an end to end. And so that's the beauty, right? It's like now you are because with feature engineering you are throwing data away, right? You only learn from whatever you summarized in your feature, whatever you thought to 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 include there. While the GNN can really now learn from the entirety of your data, from the from all the entities, from the entire schema, right. and identify a signal if it's two 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 tables away, three tables away, right. it's going to bring that signal there. And you will never do a three-way join to do feature engineering, right? Like mm -hmm. I, you wouldn't come up with that ever, right? So so that's the that's the beauty, right. um, and. I can, you know, I, I, I'm excited about this, so I can, I can keep yeah. talking. But that's the kind of the key innovation is that you can finally do a representation learning yeah. on multi-tabular data, right? When people say tabular machine learning, they mean one table. Right. That's kind of not useful. You want multiple tables. And Kumo can so let's, let's say if I'm a you know, data scientist and I'm you know, building like these type of uh, tabular data models um, and uh, I have a database and now I want to represent it as a graph and get started on GNNs. So now what's like, how should I go about it? Um, I think you have two options. Um, option number one is that you go open source, you use uh, PyTor Geometric, which is the open source library um, we developed uh, at Stanford. Um, and we have uh, kind of strong backing and strong partnership with NVIDIA and Intel mm -hmm. who are making sure that the library is optimized and, and, and um, uh, runs really well on their hardware. It was even uh, showcased in Jensen Huang's uh, keynote and things like that, right? So, uh, and we have a big uh, user base. Uh, well, I think it's almost like 400 contributors, nearly 20,000 GitHub stars, uh, active Slack channel of 5,000, 4,000 people and so on. So it's a huge community. And, and it's a default GNN library uh, for um, uh, for for all the research, so all the latest, the greatest is implemented on top of PyG or uh, uh, Pytorch Geometric, uh, as it's called. So it's PyG.org, PyG.org. Um, so that's one way to do it. The problem with that is that even if you have the library, it took us, you know, a team of engineers and about four years at Pinterest to build an entire machine learning platform around it. Mm -hmm. um, so what you have to take care of is you have to uh, care of how to get from raw data to the graph. Uh, how are you going to store that graph? How are you going then to create mini batches from that graph so that now you can you can specify your GNN architecture in PyTorch and train that? And then, you know, where will you store the model? How are you going to serve that? Uh, how are you going to kind of manage the life cycle and so on? So there's a lot of stuff to do. Mm -hmm. um, so what we... Uh, uh, built at Kumo is we built a scalable industrial grade graph learning platform mm -hmm. that basically allows you to just not even, you don't even have to worry about the graph. All you worry about is what tables do you want to use and what are primary foreign key relations between the tables. Mm -hmm. And the tables can include text, they can include images, all that is fine. All right? And then on top of and then on top of that, basically the platform automatically creates a graph out of that, distributes it across the machines, yeah. and, and it's ready for, it's ready to be used for machine learning. Right, right. So, the, so let me, so before I move on to the generative AI topic, there are some interesting questions that have come okay. on the chat. So let me pick up a few of these things. Uh, you know, so, so a few questions are like, can we use GNNs in financial forecasting? You know, uh, or like, how do you prevent overfitting of these GNNs, you know, because you're basically trying to model so many relationships and, you know, first order, second order relationships that are present in the data. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you sort of, uh, you know, take care of those things? Great point. Uh, so we've seen uh, a huge range of applications for these, for these GNNs. And the reason for that is that if you think of the graph terms, you have different types of tasks in a graph. You mm -hmm. can have tasks that are predicting about a single node. Right, mm -hmm. so what's example of that? As an example is predicting churn, predicting lifetime value, right? You are, pre you know, maybe predicting sales volume of a product. That's about one node, one node, one entity. So that's great. So you can do all these type of prediction problems. Then you can do link uh, pairwise prediction problems. 
So what's an example of that? Example is um, affinity, brand affinity, recommendation. What yeah. products is the customer going to buy next, right? So you yeah. are predicting something about the customer and the product, and you are predicting something about this link. So specifying all kinds of recommender system problems, brand affinity, things like that, um, very easy in the same framework. Mm. And then last, you can also do graph or subgraph level prediction tasks, which, mm. for example, is very natural if you say, is this molecule toxic or not, right? Because a molecule is a graph of friendships, bonds between the atoms. So it's a graph. A molecule is not a string. The, the most natural representation is graphical. I have the atoms and how the atoms bond with each other. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can do these types of things. Or if you want to do some kind of fraud or uh, anti-money laundering and things like that. Yeah. Um, and of course, the question was uh, forecasting. You can build beautiful forecasting models because the, the, the network can learn both from your own time series. So you can do this kind of autoregressive, but then also based on the correlations, connections with other with other time series that you have, let's say sales of other products, you yeah. can really learn how to borrow information optimally from other entities to make to make an accurate prediction. So we've seen also really good performance on forecasting. Yeah. So one of the things with this activity data, right? Whether you know, let's say you're trying to model churn in a in a high scale website, or you know, there, there's constantly the data is changing. You know, now we have all this sophisticated data infrastructure that's built to collect the data and update these databases, right? Yeah. How scalable are these GNNs to to be updatable? You know, and to retrain them. Do we have to retrain them every time there's new data that shows up? How does how do they work in practice? That's a great that's a great question, right? So if I was uh, earlier saying that these embedding methods they need to be recomputed every time, uh, graph neural networks are not like that. Graph neural networks are inductive. What does this mean? Is that when your graph is changing and you want to make a prediction for a node, all you have to do is quickly identify the breadth first search tree around that node and make a prediction. So mm -hmm. you can train on one part of the graph and apply the model to the next part of the graph. Mm -hmm. So what people, for example, uh, do in practice is that maybe you would retrain your model at some cadence, maybe weekly or monthly or whatever, but then mm. you would apply, keep applying your model, you know, uh, daily or, or in real time or however, however you are doing this. Mm. Um, and, you know, the platform scales, um, you know, at Kuma, we scale to 50 billion entities. Mm. So we are scaling to about, you know, uh, two Pinterests uh, from yeah. a few years ago. So, so we yeah. can definitely scale. And the last thing I will say um, before we move on, if you, what is super cool about, um, about this view of doing, let's say deep learning over uh, multi-tabular data, basically over a relational store, over a data warehouse, is that the same way as in a data warehouse, you use SQL to kind of query and aggregate the past. Yeah. What we did at Kumo, we have this, SQL-like language that allows you to predict the future. And what yeah. I mean by that is, you know, if, if in the data warehouse, you would say, select me all the users, you know, whose transaction amount in the last two months was less than $100. I can do the same in Kumo by saying, select me the users whose transaction amount uh, is predicted to be less than $200 in the next two months. Yeah. And based on that specification, what Kumo does, it basically says, uh -huh, you are trying to predict some of transaction values inside that time window. Okay, so I'm going to now do a sliding window over your data and, and, and kind of interpret this query to create a target label that is time consistent. I'm going to attach this to the graph and I'm going to automatically build a model to predict that for you. Mm -hmm. So you as a data scientist, all you have to do is you have to specify what target is predicted for what entity, yeah. right? So you don't even need to create a training data set. Mm -hmm. You don't need to create a target label. You don't mm -hmm. need to worry about time travel and time consistency and you know all these bugs that we all had when you create a feature, your model works great. And then two weeks later, you realize yeah. that you, know, you are predicting something that has already happened and is captured in that feature. It, it yeah. happened to me so many times, I cannot say, right? Yeah. But yeah. that's the beauty. You can really iterate quickly and get your models out the door. Um, and maybe the last thing I say, this view of, of let's say, if no need to feature engineer on a database, it means you can get 
models that are much more performant. You can get them out of the door very quickly, and you can also easily put them in production because mm. all you need to do is you need to refresh the tables and apply the model. Refresh mm. the tables, apply the model. So really, after you define what your model is, which is basically what's the quantity that's predicted, you just have two REST API calls, retrain mm. or apply, mm. right? And, and that's it. So from design to, to, to deployment, you know, it's a, it's a REST API call. It's not yeah. that, oh, now we have to productionize this pipeline. We have to productionize these features. We have to have all these workflows. Yeah. Not really. So one of, one of the things that, you know, at Fiddler, we work with a lot of customers that care about, you know, explainability of these models, right? So when you're applying these GNNs on Tableau data, let's say, you know, how do, how do we, you know, how is, is it possible even to explain these predictions that are coming out of GNNs? You know, what are your thoughts there? That's a, that's a great, that's a great question. I think, let's say, the way we think of generally, right, or the way in the old in the old world, uh, we thought of explainability was usually through some kind of um, uh, feature feature importances, uh, trying to kind of understand how features uh, affect the prediction. Um, in the in the deep learning world, things are different because there is no explicit features, right? It's all kind of learned embeddings, if you want to think of it that right. way. So I think that like and and that's kind of the explainability we built we built at um, um, at Kumo, and what I think it's actually it's even more powerful because it allows you to point back to the raw data, right? Mm. It allows you to go back and say this column, this row, this event ha affected my prediction. It's not, mm. you know, and in this means that is much more explainable because it's much mm. more the space of explanations it's much richer than mm. saying okay you have three features here are feature importances or something mm. so mm. so we can do we can do a lot of that and we see that um, uh, it really kind of resonates with with customers that you can mm. get kind of more detailed um, mm. explanations and then of course you can do what if type things you can do cohort analysis you can do a lot of a lot of different things to really build the trust in the model and really try to understand Mm -hmm. How is the model thinking? How is the model learning? Awesome. So switching gears a little bit, uh, I think now the talk of the town is generative AI. It's been the last six to eight months now. Uh, how is uh, how are GNNs useful in building generative AI models? You know, what are some application domains that you're seeing where GNN-based generative AI models could be promising? Yes, uh, I would say there's there's very different view. Like there's a lot to say here. Um, when we say generative AI, right, like for for everyone or for most of the people, that seems to be like, you know, chat GPT is something, something, right? But really, um, at Stanford, we established uh, what we call Center for Research on Foundation Models. So really, these large language models are just one example of what we call a foundation model. And a foundation model is a large pre-trained model that is kind of pre-trained on a lot of data and has this kind of zero shot type capability. And, you know, these LLMs are, are amazing at this broad, uh, let, I, I would call them common sense, common knowledge, broad internet type, type stuff, right? Which is amazing. Um, but you can think of foundation models for other domains as well. You could think of a foundation model for biology. Mm. Right. You can think of foundation model for medicine. You can think of foundation model for drug discovery, for molecules. Yeah. Right. So now it's not only the natural language, but these models become multimodal, where one one of the model like where modalities can be images, uh, text, um, and then graph structured data, relational data as well. So we see a lot of benefit there. Um, and then where we also see a lot of so that's one way, and I'm happy to take tell more about these kind of foundation models beyond natural language and, and kind of this, I don't know, common sense knowledge or whatever you want to call it. Um, and then another place where we see huge use of uh, GNNs or graphs for generative AI is knowledge. It's knowledge bases, like your private data, most val valuable private data, again, is stored in, in, in relational tables. Some of it might be text and you could index that text through this kind of retrieval augmented um, generation. But now imagine if you have live data in a database or if you have a knowledge graph of some sort that describes your, your business. And, 
and you want your your chatbot to be accurate not to hallucinate right if you say you know maybe uh, you know fiddler company has a knowledge graph about how does krishna like his coffee <laughs> and 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 you know when a new i don't know somebody asks you know how does krishna like the coffee we'd like to make sure we we have the right answer right and and if you know you change your preference or whatever that that is readily re reflected in the answers of the of the of the of the model and this is not about you know so having some document database or something right. like that it's having this structure maybe it's you know how much of each product do we have in stock what's mm -hmm. the price what is this and 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 that's where um mm -hmm. this becomes very important it's now basically thinking of this as multi-model mm -hmm. but not mo modality as image and text but more as like text and a database or text and a relational knowledge graph that can be updated live and can be retrieved from uh to uh to 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 give more accurate answers and we've developed some research um and have papers around this um as well as we are working on this at, at kuma so we are very excited about this direction as well so, so let's say if we were to develop a foundation model on a particular uh, set of structured data let's say you know it could be biological data sets or maybe other structured data sets financial data sets mm -hmm. now would you then could you then you know sort of use that foundation model and you know kind of like fine-tune it for your own data sets or do you the kind of some of the practices that llms are exposing are they applicable for these foundational gnms or is that like still kind of research right now no no definitely i think you you have two you have two ways uh one way is to think of this as uh, as fine-tuning Another one is to think to basically have a re retriever that doesn't retrieve passages, but retrieves parts of your knowledge base in a, right. in a structured forum, right? So you can think of this as background knowledge or as up-to-date knowledge that you are, you are retrieving back to the LLM, and then you are kind of communicating with that through the, through the natural language interface. Right. Um, right. Becomes also very interesting, right? Because what this also allows you to do is allows you to do predictions, right? Mm -hmm. Like especially with the Kuma functionality, right? Today, right. kind of LLMs are able to give you this kind of expected common sense answers. Maybe they are able to retrieve something from some static or dynamic knowledge base. But mm -hmm. as soon as you would start asking predictive questions, mm -hmm. uh, then Kuma also nicely comes in as a predictive platform that's end-to-end -end data driven. And and mm -hmm. you know, it's not like you ask a predictive question and then the 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 the, the chatbot says, okay, thank you. Now please give me the please engineer the features for me. Right? Yeah. It's not like that. So, so you could layer on like a conversation interface on top of the GNN to not only just like get knowledge, but also just have some you know predictions being done on the data. Basically. Exactly, exactly. You can start conversing about what's going to happen, what is predicted right. to happen, or even like if you think about missing data imputation and things like that. GNNs yeah. are state of the art for missing kind of for missing data or for incomplete data or for something that hasn't yet happened or something that you haven't observed yet and so on. Awesome. So great. This is awesome. Uh, let me take a few more audience questions at this point. Uh, uh, there's an interesting question. Uh, I think this is a this is probably a, a lot of people have in this stage, right? So, you know, how do you decide to move from a collaborative filtering of type of approaches for recommendation models based on similarity and past history to a graph neural network? You know, when would you do that? Is scale and cost a consideration? Uh, you know, obviously, collaborative filtering has been there for a long time, and obviously, GNNs are taking it to the next level. What, what is what are your thoughts? I think, um, you know, you do it when, I'm, I'm, my answer would be, you always do it. The question is, can you do it? Can you pull it off, right? I think it's really the, the honest answer. It's, okay. it's um, I would say it requires a lot of expertise, both at the, at the system building, if you want to do it yourself, yeah. you know, it, it, it took, it took a, a, a team of really strong people plus, plus myself, right? Uh, mm -hmm. to to do this to do this at, at pinterest so um we, you you will see benefits in kind of immediately or you know through through experimentation you are you are you are going to see them but the the system becomes uh, much more complex mm -hmm. um and then the problem is that if you are starting to stitch this system together you will say oh let me i know use some graph database you know there are vendors, uh, you know, there's Neptune, there is Neo4j and so on. But then those things are like super slow, not yeah. optimized for machine learning. So it will be a huge 
you know, kind of at the end, it will be a yeah. disaster in a sense. You'll be working on that and it'll be like, hey, it doesn't work. This is not for us and, and so on. And that's kind of the worst that can happen. So yeah. what we did at Pinterest, we built it ground up. We built our yeah. own graph store, optimized for machine learning and so on. Yeah. And, and we got amazing results. Uh, at Kuma, we now have the platform for others to try out and, 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 and to use. Yeah. Um, and we have clients who are, for example, you know, have 200 million users uh, doing uh, re doing rec doing basically product or order recommendations over over 200 million users, mm -hmm. and and you know we are beating internal teams with you know real time capabilities and and years of uh, model tuning. So um, another option is to to simply go and try out uh, try out Kuma. Yeah. Um, and I would say last thing, right, like. These models are not that heavy, heavy in a sense, right? Like that now you have uh, billions of parameters. They are they are more lightweight. So even even on two hundred million users, you know, it it takes a it mm. takes a day to train. Mm. So so there are also governance related concerns here, right? So you know people uh, are worried about you know if we are encoding all of this information in a graph, and let's say you know you have to delete some parts of the graph, you know if you have to delete some users, you know you know how how would how, how would these genins allow for that? You know, could you modify these things? Could you? Uh, oh yeah, you yeah. The the graph models? you can graph gets refreshed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can re uh, refresh the graph daily or whatever. So so it's no it's no problem. It's no problem at all at kind of updating and and kind of having this, uh, you know, uh, forgetting and and updating and adding and removing. That's that's very easy. And yeah, the you you want your underlying data structure to be uh, to be up to date so 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 that that we def, that of course we take care of so you basically delete the delete whatever nodes or uh, you know rows you can delete or you know you make you sure refresh the model basically exactly you refresh uh, the the model doesn't need to be retrained or refreshed because it's so flexible what's going to change is that st structure of that bfs tree is going to change a bit mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. the gnn is so flexible that it can ingest any any tree, mm. any any BFS tree, right? In a in, mm. in if you want to think of it that way. So uh, the graph changes, the model can still be applied. You you drop all the all the connections of one type, the the model can still be applied. So mm. the you drop twenty percent of the connections, the mm. model can still be applied. So the mo these models are super robust to 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 changes to noise to drop out things like that. So. That's not uh, not an issue at all. All you have to do is make sure that your tables in in a data warehouse are up to date. So if you know how to delete a row from a table, mm -hmm. the re the rest Kuma will take care of. Mm -hmm. So there's a more uh, a more detailed technical question. Uh, you know, when you are training these models, right? How do you fix the number of layers? You know, is it based on the data volume? And uh, have you ever faced over smoothing uh, problems in industrial applications? You know, like uh, and this is more of a technical question as you mm -hmm. build. AI, yeah, you know, what were the things that you had to go through? No, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, I think the the specific answers to this are a bit um, domain or use case specific. Mm -hmm. um, but what I would say is, for example, um, it the the depth will depend kind of on the structure of your graph, right? So if you are a kind of a natural social network like graph, then then you will. Um, you will go a couple of steps deep, right? But your individual layers can be very expressive and very powerful. But like in the, because really the way to think of this is you have two types of depth. You have the depth in terms of uh, neural network layers and you have a depth in terms of the graph depth. And, and the two shouldn't be confused, mm -hmm. right? So you could, in a social network, if you go six steps away, you reached every human on the earth. So you don't want to learn from every human on the earth. Uh, it's it's over smoothing and all, all that that we were discussing. So you want to go maybe two steps away. But yeah. what you want to do is you want your layers to be to be kind of much more expressive or to kind of each layer to include kind of multiple sub layers, if you want to think of that way, of data processing that really learns how to combine and aggregate this information. And that's really that's really the trick is to have a pre-processing layers. Uh, then the the message passing layers, post processing layers, and then stack this together. So you need to think of this hierarchically uh, right. to 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 do this, right? And of course, now if you have I know a long molecule, a long protein, then you want to have a deep network that propagates information from one part to the molecule to the other part, yeah. which is different, right?
Yeah. And so like these days people are using lots of, you know, vector databases to sort of, uh, you know, store their, uh, you know, you know, you know, private knowledge and private data, you know, would this change, you know, with like when you're trying to use GNNs or do you do vector databases coexist with GNNs or do you have to go to a graph store or, you know, how no. does that? So, so um, first I think maybe you said graph store. So de definitely vector databases are great for using embeddings and retrieving them. Mm -hmm. um, what is nice with, um, uh, of course, and with GNNs, you can output your embeddings. For yeah. example, if uh, people follow, uh, let's say, Pinterest work and Pinterest uh, research papers that we've published, in Pinterest, we embedded everything in the same space. Users, okay. queries, pins, and, and it was amazing. You actually it improved our, our search as well. Like people would type in queries, we would embed that and retrieve based on the, based on the learned embeddings. And we were re really able to kind of, do search in a data-driven human feedback type of way to, to, yeah. to a huge benefit, right? So definitely that is the case. Um, what I will, I will say is in some sense, you need both, right? You need, you need either, you need, you need a graph store to yeah. generate these BFS trees mm -hmm. that define the structure of the GNN. And of course, in the end, you don't, you don't really generate a BFS, but you are very smart how do you generate that tree? Because yeah. you know, if you hit Kim Kardashian, then you are kind of yeah, your dead, graph right? Is like, it's yeah, like fan out is huge. Yeah. The fan out is huge. All connections are meaningless. There's nothing yeah. to do there, right? So yeah. you want to be more strategic how yeah. you how you avoid uh, avoid nodes like that, right? Like yeah. kind of yeah. joking a bit, right? But yeah. so so uh, Kumo provides a platform that allows you to do that. Otherwise, you have to build this yourself and innovate it yourself. But we are very smart and very careful. How do we sample? that tree structure from which we learn and which nodes get selected and which nodes are informative for yeah. the prediction task. So there's a lot of smarts in there. It's not just, oh, do the BFS and so on, because yeah, you hit a high degree node and then yeah. what do you do, right? Um, so that is that is the case. And then of course, you, you, you can then index the embeddings and retrieve. Yeah. What is interesting, and we've seen this actually in, in some use cases is that embeddings can be very limiting. Yeah. Especially if you think in, let's say, this kind of recommender system um, uh, setting, you know, there is an embedding of the user and there is an embedding of the item. But yeah. really, the embedding of items for you, Krishna, is different than it is for me. Right. right? So it means that if I have fixed embeddings for items and, and, and let's say, embeddings for users, then right. users can kind of only move around these items. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what we find out is that if you use the GNN directly, that can then basically what GNN is doing internally, it's almost like creating a per user specific embedding of all the products. Right. So you are yeah, getting yeah. you are getting huge improvement in 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 accuracy because yeah. you are not materializing the embeddings, but you let the GNN to actually give you. You the are score. using the BFS approach to dynamically figure out the exactly right, the exactly the user. exactly. Yeah, so right. conceptually, what's doing it's almost like giving you personalized product yeah. embeddings, right. so you can really retrieve in a personalized way. Yeah. So and the, and the question related to embeddings has come. Uh, you know. How is the node embedding in comparison with KG embeddings like trans C, rotate E, and how could, how could how could it be effective in link prediction? Um, good. So here is that like all this uh, like knowledge graph um, uh, um, uh, completion like trans E complex and 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 trans R and rotate E and all all those guys right? These are all based on shallow embeddings, mm -hmm. right? They all just estimate a. a an embedding of the of the node in the graph, and and in those cases, they are the the underlying assumption is that you have a set of node ID and a set of uh, relation relation types. So you are usually learning something per relation. So that's very it's shallow. Mm -hmm. There's no neural network. It's the I think it's the old, I would say it's the old school of doing this. So now if you have a uh, kind of this uh, attribute less information less knowledge graph that only has the relational structure, then those, those methods I think are, are good. But what you have in reality, you have rich data associated with the nodes. So you want to be using GNNs to do, uh, to do, to do link prediction. Mm -hmm. So for example, uh, one of the methods that works really well for link prediction on GNNs is called IDGNN that mm -hmm. goes back to those personalized embeddings that I was mm -hmm. uh, saying earlier. So um, 
and and of course what you then get with the graph neural network is you get now a function that yeah. computes the embedding so you can apply this function to any node in the graph the graph structure can change and you just reapply the function so you are inductive you can generalize you can transfer to new graphs and so on cool awesome so yeah maybe like one last question from my side as we wrap up uh, you know thank you so much for uh, spending spending time with us what, what are you looking forward to Yure, in this field you know this is a very exciting new space uh, you know I, I have dabbled myself in some graph theory in grad school and you know worked in graph partitioning and all and i'm always fascinated by graphs applying graphs to neural networks is very interesting and seems very expensive computationally creating these personalized embedding models uh, but it seems like you guys have cracked something here w what is it what are you excited about in this space like what is what is in, in maybe uh, uh, what 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 are you looking forward to this year in this yeah space? what i'm like really i think what is what is exciting i'll, I'll answer this from several viewpoints i think what uh, you know what always bothered me um in in this space is that uh, where does the graph come from and and mm. it seemed like you know graph feels like this abstract mathematical concept and people were, were pushing it away so from that point of view, I'm really, really excited about what we are doing at, with Kuma because it's not about graphs. It's bigger than graphs. It's about relational data. It's about data in data warehouses. And of course, there is graphs underneath, which is, which is awesome, which you know, makes, me, makes me happy. But from the user customer point of view, they don't need to think about this, you know, I don't know, dry mathematical representation. They can really think about uh, the data and the relationships between the data. So that's... That's something I think can really change uh, and have huge impact in industry. So that's what I'm really um, excited about. Uh, on the research uh, research side, um, we are very excited about these, you know, notions of like pre-training uh, foundation models for this type of data, uh, zero shot capability, few shot capability, and and you know how would you transfer learn across graphs across data sets? That becomes very very interesting. Um, I think it's really cool, like now kind of going back to the notion of, of Kumo, right? Because traditionally in machine learning with manual feature engineering, you, you don't even know what is transfer learning, what yeah. is pre-training. You cannot, in, like, would yeah. you do, like, it's like, doesn't, those concepts don't exist. Yeah. But now that you have a neural network that you can apply to your data warehouse, yeah. now you can start thinking about pre-training you can start thinking about multitask training you have a task with lots of data you have a task with little data you can you can have the bottom layers of neural network shared or or whatever right so you can do all these kinds of things that were unachievable or it wasn't even clear what they mean in the old world of single table let's do feature engineering but now you can you can pre-train you can multitask especially your kind of data poor uh, or data imbalance tasks benefit benefit in a huge way through this uh, new view on the on the learning in data warehouses so that's what i'm really excited about and kind of you know think it through how 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 would this vision materialize and how do we you know make it performant beautiful and useful awesome very exciting you know uh, super fascinating uh, no, thank you so much for spending time with us today uh, i've learned a ton uh, talking to you i'm sure our listeners have learned a lot uh, you know, for those of you, I don't think you need any introduction to Yure. You can go and uh, search his Stanford page, you know, his startup, Kumo AI. If you have any questions, you, you know, feel free to, you know, to reach out to him, I guess. Yeah. And it's easy to find my email address. So. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Thank awesome. you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. I enjoyed Thanks. it a lot. Thank you, Krishna. And thanks, everyone, for uh, attention and for uh, really good, insightful questions. Absolutely. Thank you. So much. Awesome. Thank you.